order at 7 p.m. on January 15, 2015. Would everyone please rise for the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item is the adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have an agenda. I now turn over the meeting to Mrs. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Tonight begins kind of stage two of our budget preparation. You'll recall at your January 6th meeting, Ms. Miano shared what we know about the budget uh, from the governor's uh, release at that point. And tonight, uh, we're going to first hear from our employee groups, and then I'm going to present my first vision for what the budget for 2015-16 needs-based budget for Montgomery County Public Schools may look like. So at this point, our first speaker as listed on the agenda is Robbie Jones and Matt Fentress representing Montgomery County Education Association. <laughs> you got lots of reinforcements, it's Robbie. A bunch of <laughs> Good evening. How are y'all doing this evening? Great. I am Robbie Jones, and I would like to thank Chairman Lyons and Ms. Blackburn for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, as we begin another budget season, like I said, my name is Robbie Jones. I'm president of the Montgomery County Education Association. With me is Matthew Fentress, vice president of the Montgomery County Education Association, and Elizabeth Betsy Osborne. Uh, secretary of the association. Tonight I'll begin with, um, in recent years, we have spoken to the school board many times about extending our respect for high standards for the realm of teaching and learning in the realm of employee compensation and working conditions. In order to maintain quality educational opportunities for all, we respectfully asked you to put people before things as you develop a proposed budget for the 2015-16 school year. Our compensation objectives. First, we'd like to thank you for your pledge to reinstate and honor the accuracy of the experience-driven salary scales. The two-step adjustment to the scale was helpful and greatly valued by your employees. During this budget cycle, we asked you to recommit to the second phase of the plan to correct the scale by providing an additional two-year step adjustment. We're going to work in groups tonight, so we're going to pass it off to Matthew. Hopefully you don't get dizzy. Yeah. Matthew Fentress, um, talking on health insurance, we ask you to maintain current levels of insurance coverage and continue to cover the premium for the single HMO employee. Any increase in employee contributions amount to a decrease in compensation. Basically, a healthy staff equals and leads to engaged students and will save money. Um, Betsy Osborne, and I am here to speak tonight. One of the objectives I'm speaking on is uh, no further downsizing of staff. I'm a middle school teacher. I teach seventh grade. And we've been hit pretty hard due to budget cuts and the decisions being made um, to save some money when people are lost due to attrition. We're asking that this year, please don't lose any more of our staff members. Um, please fill the spots that are lost to attrition um, so that we don't hurt anymore. Currently, all part-time support staff employees earn a sick leave rate of a half a day a month which equals to five days per year. We asked the school board to amend this policy so our part-time colleagues are allotted 10 sick days per calendar year. These individuals are oftentimes the ones working hands-on with the students, more so than the classroom teacher, which increases the risk of contacting illnesses 
which also frequently takes control of the school system. And our final objective tonight is actually a zero dollar budget objective, and I'm pretty sure you won't get that anywhere else tonight. Um, when we start teaching, when you start your teaching career, when you start a new school year, it's as though you're given a plate. And on your plate, you're told you can put anything you want on it. So you get a delicious plate full of good food. And then people come in and they add more and they add more. So finally, you've got this big plate that's overwhelming, that's heavy, that your good stuff is still there, but it's hard to find. And that good stuff that's there is our curriculum. It's our students. And that's what gets us excited to teach. And in order to get back down there, you have to dig through all the other stuff. What I'm asking for, what we are asking for as a community, as an MCEA, and even as a nation, this is something that's a nationwide problem, we're asking that you all consider no new incentives to our already overwhelming responsibility. When we are overwhelmed and stressed out, it makes us have focus less and less on succeeding and teaching these students and being successful as staff members, as teachers. And so what we're asking for is that we realize that the state comes in and says, okay, for me specifically, I'm seventh grade social studies, so we lost our SOL this year. So in return, the state says you have to be able to show student success. We understand that. We know that that's something that's coming in that we're being asked to do. What we're asking for is that on a local level, please don't give us any new responsibilities that we already have. Give us something, let us be able to take what programs we've already got running, work on them, let them be successful, and give us one year to get our heads above the water. On behalf of Montgomery County employees and members of Montgomery County Education Association, we would like to thank you for this opportunity and your past support as a profession of creating generations of educated citizens. We ask you to continue to make the investment in students and staff members. And that's what I got scripted. But on the way here, I, I passed Christiansburg Institute and I was thinking 150 years ago, that was pretty amazing. And then I started thinking about 20, 25 years ago, it was educating Peter. You know, uh, a couple of days ago, I met with you know, somebody and we talked about a product. Not that we should call students a product, but we do amazing things in this county. And so we're told to engage, encourage, and empower. You all have in your hands to engage, encourage, and empower us. And so I'm thinking of where is the future for us? Um, because I, I love what I do. I think we all do, right? And so I want it to be a very bright future for our students and also the people, the caretakers of the students. So um, engage, encourage, and empower. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening will be for Montgomery County Principals Association, and they are being rep represented this evening by Rick Weaver. Good evening, Mrs. Blackburn, Chairman Lyons, and members of the board. I'm Rick Weaver, the Compensation Chair for the Montgomery County Principals Association. Our association represents principals, assistant principals, and instructional supervisors. Thank you for allowing me to represent this group of employees here this evening. Our members are fully aware of the budget difficulties that you as a board have had to dealt with, deal with for several years, and we appreciate the effort that you have made to support all MCPS employees. We encourage you to stay the course and continue the work toward restoring full and equitable compensation for all employees. The strength of our school division is clearly the dedicated staff at all levels who come to work every day and readily accept the demands placed on them. 
Both of the board's first two budget priorities for 2015-16 reflect the importance of our staff. Those, those goals, as you know, are to enhance student programs and to address individual salaries with a long-term plan. To enhance student programs, it's essential to attract and ret retain highly qualified staff. And the single most important factor in attracting and retaining staff is providing competitive salaries and benefits. It's clear how connected these top two priorities are. We encourage you to continue supporting the Compensation Improvement Plan. That effort will ensure equitable compensation for every employee. Thank you very much for your past and your future support. Thank you, Rick. And next this evening, speaking on behalf of our maintenance and custodial workers, I have Robbie Jones. Robbie? Earl. Okay, Earl, great. Come on forward. Thank you for being here tonight. Members of the board, Ms. Blackman, my name is Earl Brown. I'm a senior custodian at Margaret Beeks Elementary School, and personally, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to come to speak before you tonight, representing the facilities department, which encompasses the maintenance and custodial services for our schools. First, I would like to thank the board for their past support and hopefully for your future support. We are aware that you are faced with difficult challenges and decisions concerning the budget, for this year. We hope you will continue to support our request for equipment that will improve productivity and cleaning efficiency in maintaining our schools. Last year's budget included a compensation study which included aligning staff to catch up with compensation for years of service and maintaining the current salary. But please continue those efforts and for those employees at the top of their scales, consider some type of cost of living adjustment because there's just so many changes going on with the economy today. We ask that you continue to make the best decisions because of everyday changes concerning health insurance for employees. As we look down the road, please continue to fund our association being a part of the VSRS system for our people that will be retiring as the future comes closer for those people including myself. Now due to recent construction and the opening of some new schools, we have some excellent facilities in Montgomery County in the school system. Some of those schools are technologically advanced and energy efficient for our students. With your help, we can continue to provide and maintain a self, a safe and healthy environment for our students as they prepare for their futures. When the facilities department, custodial services maintains our schools, sure we wish that at points that someone like Samantha from, I, from Bewitched or I Dream of Jeannie could twitch her nose or blink their eye and <laughs> schools would be clean for the next day. It's not that simple. Uh, it takes people and equipment and uh, schools now are such advanced that uh, they have systems where you used to have the boiler zone at one time that would run the entire school, but now we've got schools where you can control areas and specific rooms so much energy is not being used. We need training for those people to continue these types of things to save. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak for you tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much. Our next speaker this evening will be speaking for bus drivers and transportation, and that's Keisha Miller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board and Ms. Blackburn. My name is Keisha Miller, and I have driven a school bus for 18 years, 12 of those years here in Montgomery County. I'm here to speak on behalf of the bus drivers and the bus aides. First of all, we would like to say that we appreciate you reinstating two of our pay steps this school year, and hopefully you will reinstate two additional steps per your projected plan during last year's budget meetings. 
My fellow school bus drivers and aides and myself are very concerned about the effect that the Affordable Health Care Act may have on our wages. Since the Affordable Health Care Act is now mandated by law for working people in the United States to either enroll in a plan or be penalized, we have had to comply using our incentive benefit to pay for it. Of course, that was the original intent for it to be used for health care and for retirement. So the concern of the bus drivers and bus aides is this. At times, we feel that we are placed on the back burner and that we are often forgotten until someone speaks out <clears throat> for us saying that we really are a valuable asset to this county. Many of us do not work 30 hours or more a week, but we still must have health care. We are concerned that the incentive benefit will be taken away and used for those drivers and aides and others that do work 30 or more hours, but where, was that, where would that leave the rest of us that do not work 30 hours? We cannot afford to take a large cut in pay for a law that we have no control over. However, if we were given the same consideration for health care and VRS as teachers and other full-time employees, these concerns would not arise. Drivers and other part-time employees in many of our surrounding counties have had health care and retirement benefits for many years. Last year, one county took away their driver's benefits and a large number of them resigned. That is probably the last thing that you would want to have happen in this county. We have already lost several drivers during the last couple of years because of the lack of benefits. Qualified professional drivers are very difficult to find and training is expensive. To my understanding, it costs the school system a minimum of $1,200 to train one new driver. There is no incentive for them to stay since there is no benefit for bus drivers or aides until after the first three years. And if that incentive is taken away, then what would be the incentive to stay at all? Part-time employees are the foundation of the school system. School bus drivers and aides take the students to and from school safely each day. Teacher aides assist the teachers with meeting their educational needs. Cafeteria workers give them nutrition, nutritional meals, and the nurses are there whenever a health problem arises. We have highly qualified people in all of the part-time positions, and without them, the children would suffer. Is it worth losing the part-time employees over a lack of benefits and a requirement that is out of our control since we must have a health care plan? Will you even be able to find enough qualified people to take their places? The number of available full-time jobs in this area is constantly growing, so what would be the appeal to work for this county? Please consider funding the health care requirement for the future of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Our next speaker this evening is for uh, food services, Michael Marcinelli. Michael. Good evening, Mr. Lyons, Ms. Blackburn, members of the board. Thank you for having me tonight, and I want to wish you all a happy new year. My name is Michael Marcinelli. I'm the supervisor of school nutrition programs, and I'm here representing the, uh, the school lunch lady group. Um, not here asking for anything. Um, we recognize that uh, any decisions made on behalf of our uh, group, and they did want me to share their appreciation for the step increases that they received this past year. But they also recognize that any decisions made um, must be borne out on the other side by increased sales and, and us being able to generate the funds to do that, uh, since we do pay our, uh, our labor costs uh, directly out of our account. Um, but other than that, just as a reminder that uh, um, we are, must sell more to pay more. Um, and uh, uh, just to, to remind you that and to say thank you for all of the support you've shown in the past and, and your continued support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker this evening will be representing technology, and it's Mickey Williams. Mickey. Good evening, members of the board. I am here to represent probably the most well-represented group here tonight, these fine individuals behind me, which represent your technology department. And we have a couple of issues that we want to bring to your attention tonight. Uh, we want to start off with staffing. Um, 
We still have the same 15 positions today that existed back in 1998. Since that time, most, if not all, of the division's instructional decisions or programs requires technology. Whether it is something, something as simple as enrolling a student at a school to implementing your programs such as 21st Century, Backpack Initiative, the Security Grant, or supporting resources that improve SOL scores for accreditation ratings. Maintaining school-wide services such as email and MUNIS, PowerSchool, and internet access. Designing and opening new schools, rel relocating existing schools, or just providing daily maintenance throughout the division on all technology equipment. I would invite members of the board and administration to our office to take a look into what it takes to provide technology related services to the district. And I also would request that uh, additional staffing would be considered since technology is a main focus in this division and while the technology continues to grow, our staffing remains the same. The second issue I would like to bring your attention tonight would be a salary scale. In 2007, we met with the previous central office administration to address some of the problems that our current scale has. A plan was derived from that meeting to gather the necessary information to provide a more equitable salary scale. During the process, a slide step concept was approved that enabled employees that reached the top of their level to slide to the beginning of the next level. This slide step concept would turn the current 12 step support staff scale into a 24 step scale and would only be in effect until the salary scale could be modified or replaced. Due to the recession in 2008, the slide step and the salary scale uh, adjustment was never realized due to lack of funding. But then this past year, you, uh, the board approved um, compensation for the employees and we assume that this slide step would be in effect for these employees that are at the top of the scale. But this summer after meeting with the current administration, there was evidently no document documentation mentioning the slide step in their files. The results were the employees at the top of our 12 step scale would not receive the slide step and advance to the next level as promised and these employees did not receive the full salary compensation approved by the board last year. The current salary scale has many deficiencies and there is no plan in place to correct the scale. The 12 step scale limits the earning potential and advancement opportunities to staff and the ability for MCPS to attract future high, highly qualified and experienced employees. There will be seven out of 15 employees at the top of our scale by the end of this year and two more in the next two years. These employees will not benefit from any salary step advancements approved by the board. We ask that a plan be put in place to acquire the necessary salary studies and market analysis to create a scale that is equitable and provide employees the opportunity to work to retirement age. We also ask that a short term solution, similar to the one promised to us in 2007, be implemented to ensure employees do not miss out on future raises. Once again, we thank you for your support and we hope that you uh, support these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Our next group to be um, spoken to speak this evening are our administrative assistants, and they're being represented this evening by Lori Walls. Good evening. I'm Lori Walls. I work at Blacksburg Middle School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on behalf of administrative assistants. Like other groups, we are hopeful that our school system can begin to make positive progress towards funding salary scale changes that have been on hold since 2008 school year. During the 2008-2009 school year, several support service group salary scales were reviewed. Well-deserved salary increases were given to the groups, reviewed with the exception of evidently technology and administrative assistance. New salary scales were drafted and a plan was in place for our administrative assistance group to be adjusted the following school year, 2009-2010. However, the following year was when the budget crisis hit and our adjustments were put on hold. During that same year, the county also hired an outside firm to conduct a study of our administrative assistance groups. 
Their review included an evaluation of our salaries compared to other responsibilities, the assignment of positions to the salary scale, as well as comparing our salaries to similar positions in other school districts and with local employers. Since that study, workloads have increased and become more complex due to advances in technology and the implementation of new legal protocols and safety procedures. We are still one of a few groups who have not received salary scale changes. As a result of this lack of funding, we have lost seasoned employees to jobs outside the county. At least two of these school employees were recruited by the county and Virginia Tech, where we each were each received higher wages. As with any profession, longevity and con continuity enhance the effectiveness of the business. We respectfully request that you consider the administrative assistance as you make the decisions concerning our division budget. Thank you for your time and your service to our schools. Thank you, Lori. Our next group would be our instructional assistants, and I don't have a name to represent them this evening, so if there's someone here this evening who wanted to speak to the instructional assistants, please come forward. Okay, seeing none. I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. We appreciate the great jobs that you do. We know you have great ideas, and uh, again, we're delighted to hear from you this evening, and we'll move through this process that over the last five years has become quite painful, and I suspect it might be again this year, but I um, remained optimistic that there are good solutions out there. So the next item for this evening is actually uh, the presentation of the superintendent's budget. And as directed by the board, it is a needs-based budget that I'll be presenting this evening. I appreciate it if you'd bear with me. I think this is one of the most important things that we do. And there, it's a very technical uh, issue. A lot of things are not in writing, as we continuously find out, just as our technology group was just mentioning. And I think we're trying to um, set a path for the future that will have a solid trail uh, for you to follow and not leave things subject to chance or to changing in positions, but to try to lay it out so that there is a roadmap to follow as it relates to employee compensation and also to continue to maintain uh, the quality instructional programs to keep our staff who are indeed talented and uh, to make other needed improvements to the school system. I found it a daunting task this year uh, again to uh, begin this process of looking at what we have and what we need and so I thank you for bearing with me a little bit this, this evening as it will take me a little time uh, to go through all of the things that I wanted to share with you tonight. The uh, presentation is available electronically on Board Docs, and when we actually get to looking at the line-by-line -line budget, uh, we will be passing out copies of those, and we have some for those folks who are in the audience as well. So, good evening. I appreciated the opportunity tonight to hear our employees' thoughts and priorities in relationship to the 2015-2016 budget. I have an opportunity through the superintendent's advisory groups uh, to meet with many of the folks who are in the uh, audience today on a regular basis. And I find you to be a group that has great ideas. And I also know how dedicated you are to our students and to our schools uh, to a fault. Uh, within those employees that I have contact with. I also appreciate the opportunity this evening to provide you with my first round of thoughts about the needs that Montgomery County Public Schools has in the upcoming year. Your reaction this evening, as well as the ongoing process in which we are engaged to gather information, will assist me in refining my recommendations as we continue through the budget development process. As you know, at the meeting on January 6th, the board and those in the audience had an opportunity to get a first-hand look at the governor's budget recommendations and at their impact on M Montgomery County Public Schools. 
You also had an opportunity to see Governor <laughs> McAuliffe's budget priorities. It always helps if you turn the technology on. There we go. To recap, I think this graph speaks volumes. The governor's budget is flat funding for Montgomery County Public Schools. In relationship to flat funding, it is important again to emphasize the fact that the state, and notice I said the state, has not made any significant progress in restoring the K-12 education budget to the pre-recession level. The graph on the screen vividly illustrates that today we remain $7 million below the level of state funding that was provided in the year 2008-2009. It further shows that although the county has increased funding, the bottom line, for education, they have not been able to offset the loss of state money that we have experienced. You'll notice on the right the governor's educational priorities. Well, the governor says that he is education friendly. After reviewing the priorities, from my perspective, the bottom line is no additional cuts to K-12 education doesn't mean much and really isn't friendly or pro-education. My question to the governor and to the legislatures, legislators is when is there going to be a real effort to restore the things that we have lost? They are silent to this question. My focus this evening is to present you a budget for consideration that addresses the true needs of this school division. You clearly told me that you want a needs-based budget. So what does a needs-based budget look like? These are the faces of a needs-based budget. A needs-based budget provides for the highly individualized needs of our 9,600 students, the children we serve each and every day in our classrooms. A needs-based budget does the best possible for the people who depend on us. And who are the people who depend on us? The children. A needs-based budget recognizes that our kids only have one opportunity to get a great K-12 education. There are no do-overs. A needs-based budget focuses on education equal opportunity, and safety. A needs-based budget shows our recognition of the fact that our job is to do what is in the best interest of the children we serve. A needs-based budget yields opportunities for every single child. And it is not fettered by the fact that it might require some additional money to accomplish it. A needs-based budget accomplishes your motto, your mission, and your vision, and your core value values. It will engage, encourage, and empower every student every day because it provides the resources to do so. A needs-based budget reflects the budget planning goals that the board approved at your January 6th meeting. And these have served us in previous years very well and have allowed us to make improvements even when resources were scarce. A needs-based budget reflects the extensive input that we receive from our advisory councils. Many of the members from those groups are in our audience this evening. It reflects the input 
that we receive from the community via our website that has been open and has been receiving commentary since almost the beginning of the school year. It reflects what our school board has said about what you believe a needs-based budget looks like. And it reflects what our employees who spoke this evening believe that a needs-based budget should do. And the process for gathering this information continues. Even during this week, principals have been holding meetings with staff. Department heads have been holding meetings with their staff to ask people from the grassroots up, what is it that you think this school system needs? And what are we doing that we shouldn't be doing? I think understanding the future is enhanced by taking a look at the past. And so I've got just a couple of things I'd like for you to take a look at it. You see on your left, Virginia per pupil spending. When you spend less, you generally get less. And that graph shows you that back in 2009, Virginia was way ahead of where it is now. And the track, the progress track to get back to there is not what you want to see and it's not what I want to see. In the right hand corner you have a second chart. State revenue and inflation. These facts tell the story about why we can't just continue to sit by and reduce, reduce, reduce. There's no fat left. I get $97 million this year to build a needs-based budget for the 9,600 students that we serve. But all the facts say that I need $108 million just to do what was done in 2008, 2009. So you see the line in the middle is what the facts say that I need. The line on the right is what I have. And the line on the left is what you had in 2008. I dare say you pay the same thing for anything now that you paid for it in 2008. As I prepared recommendations for the budget, I did a lot of soul searching and quite frankly, I lost a lot of sleep. I read in the paper this morning that the governor supports raises for teachers. Well, here's what I have to say. Show me the money and forget the rhetoric. In the sleepless hours, I thought about the challenges of this budget. <coughs> Finding economies. How many more can I find? That's what's happened to this school system in the last five years. There are no more economies to be found, or few. There is no fat. <coughs> I need to enhance student achievement of all of our students and attain accreditation for all of our schools because that's what our schools deserve, that's what our community deserves. And I need to do it based on the new rigorous standards. I have 21% not accredited, 79% accredited. I have 42% that did not meet federal accountability standards, and I have 58% that did. I think we're on the right path. The trend line in student achievement is up. But I can't stop now. I can't pull read 180 out of the schools. I can't pull math 180 out of the schools. I can't pull the, the exciting resources that we've been able to provide to students to help them engage with teachers in the classroom. Not if I want to stem the tide of those graphs that you see right there. What else am I challenged by? I'm challenged to restore the lost years of compensation enhancements. And each of our groups spoke about the compensation, and you should because you've not been well served over the last five years. I have to do this if I'm going to attract and retain 
the kind of high quality employees that we want for our schools. So I took a point in time slide. You could pick any place on this slide, but this data comes from uh, Region 6 and surrounding areas salary uh, comparisons, and it comes straight from the VEA, and it is 2014-2015 salaries, and it's step zero with a bachelor's degree and a 200-day calendar. <laughs> So where is Montgomery County in starting salary? Rank 10. There would be other places in the salary schedule where the rankings would be different, but I chose to use zero because last year when we had pretty significant turnover, about 60% of the people that we hired came in steps zero through five. So starting at the low end of the salary schedule is probably where uh, we should be looking to, to consider our com, uh, competitiveness, competitiveness with surrounding uh, areas. I have a challenge to restore the previous budget and personnel reductions. Betsy said it well. She said, don't take anything else away. She said, start putting some things back. So what have we taken away? $6.2 million in staffing, $147,000 from transportation, a $1 million in employee benefits, $1.3 million in instructional program enhancements, $2.3 million from our operations. And the list is right down the side for you to see again. When can I start putting back? Examples, assistance in our libraries, aids in our elementary lunchrooms, reaching the class size goals that I know the board has. I gotta have some funding to do it. Buses, an aging fleet. I think uh, some of the things that have happened in the last week or so really kind of uh, re-solidified that need in my head. And you'll recall a very cold day in the last um, week or so. And we planned to have a two-hour delay. Well, there were some people who weren't, not, weren't real happy because we changed our mind at 7.30. But it was not about how cold it was. The wind chill factor tables told us that we were in the safe zone if we picked up the kids in a reasonable length of time. But we had 13 buses that didn't start. More than we would have anticipated. And so you expect that when you have an aging fleet. We need to be buying nine buses at a minimum every year. And the most I've been able to buy in any year in the last five is four to six. So obviously, that's pretty basic math. Even I can do it. I'm way behind is the bottom line. Right now, we have 58% of our buses have over 100,000 miles. And 30 of our buses have over 150,000 miles. And that's the replacement threshold. Challenge? Yes. Projected level funding from the state. That's the challenge. No new money from the state and no prospect for funding enhancements do not allow me to address the issues that I've just listed for you. So after wrestling with the challenges, what emerged in a needs-based budget for 15-16? And I'm going to present those to you this evening. What's new? How did I establish priorities? Let me start with a summary. First of all, improved opportunities for students. And I've listed two that made my list of a needs-based budget for 2015-2016. One is some enhancements to our career and technical education program, especially accessibility. 
And second is a continuation of the e-backpack program for our high school students. The two-step salary enhancement. You are right. You deserve the two-step salary enhancement. And so I'm putting in the initial needs-based budget, one new step and one makeup step. Third, part-time benefits for 30-plus hour employees mandated by the Affordable Health Care Act. And it's unfortunate that this has been sitting out there for so long. And every year there's been a change in direction or a delay in implementation. But again, this year it's going to happen October 2015 unless there's a change in direction. And we're not going to know whether there's a change in direction or not till maybe August or September. So what does that mean for our needs-based budget? It means you have to make a decision as a board about how you're going to handle the requirement to provide a full-fledged, identical to full-time employees benefit plan for your employees who work 30 to 39.99 hours per week. Not a different plan, but the same plan that you offer to your full-time employees. So I put it in my budget because I don't really have a choice. Lapse and turnover. And this is really uh, something that you haven't seen for a while. Um, It's actually a cost adjustment in the budget. And there are a couple of board members who may have seen it before, probably Ms. Franklin and perhaps Mr. Ivers and Ms. Bond. The last time we did this was 2010-11. And this is going to be a positive for some of the challenges that we face this year because it's going to allow us to put about $1.4 million back into the budget for you to spend to take care of some of the other things that we have on our priority list. And, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about the two-step enhancement, the part-time benefits, and the lapse in turnover. But I thought it would be good just to look at the big picture first. Finally, incorporate some changes in accounting processes and procedures, really just technicalities about how you show revenue in a budget. And a response to your desire to, for more de detail through the use of a different view of the budget. Starting probably the end of May last year, I switched after uh, working with some of the board members and with finance, I switched to using this as a way to show you a little bit more about your budget. And it seems to have worked very well for you. So as I developed the budget picture and recommendations for this year, I tried to use a format that's more like this that will give you a little more detail. So Katie is going to pass out the big long budget sheet and it does look different from what you've seen in the past. And I'm going to post it a little bit later this evening to the presentation <coughs> in board docs. And I delayed giving you this because I figured you're just going to be reading the numbers on the line once I gave it to you. So please let me talk to you about it because there's some very interesting things here and I, I want you to uh, have an opportunity to hear how I process through them. First of all, I looked at the things that are in this budget and I came up with some major categories of adjustments and they were basically the economies that we talked about before, carryover moves to operating budget. You know, we've been funding quite a few things in carryover, and there's some of those that I think need to get back into the operating budget. Salaries and benefits, we've said a lot about that tonight, and they're very important. Some additional needs that the school division needs. Capital, which is forever a need for us, and a, finding a consistent uh, funding stream has been very, very challenging. And then finally, some of the accounting adjustments that I mentioned a minute ago with LAPS and uh, some things like that. So I'll start out with the first one, and I'm going to be talking about some lines on this budget document and also um, giving you a little explanation. 
So under economies, remember I gave you the great big list and told you that was really a good reason why I struggled so at finding economies. Well, we did find two. One of them is one that came from the, from the governor's budget, which is a slight reduction in our required VRS contribution. And you'll find that on line 12 on this long budget sheet that I've showed you. And it's $173,383 less that we think we're going to have to pay. And you see that it's under benefits. In that top section of personnel, it's divided into two distinct categories, salaries and wages and benefits. And this is a benefit saving. The second economy that I found, or that an employee actually found from the school division and suggested it, is on line 27. And it's in postal service. A couple of years ago, we changed how we did our bulk mailing. And it, it's working. And it appears at this point that we're going to be able to save an additional almost $16,000 in our postage costs for next year. And so we've taken that savings in line 27. You see the line 15809 right under, underneath line 27. It's actually the savings line is line 28. So then the next category that I thought we needed to you know, spend some time talking about is um, carry over to operating. You know, we have become reliant somewhat on carryover, and we're going to have some carryover this year as well. In fact, the um, lap savings will actually end up in, in carryover money or potentially carryover, so uh, you'll have some. But I looked at these items and I said, you know what, we keep putting these back. And when we experience these things, we find that they're really uh, high yield strategies for working with our students in our schools. And so I'm proposing that these should go back into the operating budget instead of being in carryover again. The first one is the field trip. And field trips, part of the new detail in your budget is that field trips is not really just one lump sum. The lump sum money is actually $32,116. But field trips breaks out into three spending categories. So you find a little piece of field trips on line four because some of it is personnel, bus drivers, for example. You find a little bit of field trips on line 13 because some of it is the benefits that go with the employee salary that's in the personnel side. And a little bit of that field trip savings is down in line 37 because it actually requires um, previously funded um, carryover, the total amount there, 15737. It comes from the fuel charges that are um, involved with field trips. So that's an excellent example of the new detail that you have in your budget. Instead of seeing field trips in one number, I've tried to show you that it's not as simple as it sounds. It's in lots of different places in little pieces. And so you can see it in this example very vividly. Um, I think we need to reinstate our field trips. Field trips provide students with opportunities to visit places where they can see how history happened where they can touch science. And it's how many of our students get to athletic and academic competitions that we participate in. And so it adds $32,116 back into the operating budget. The next one I thought we should add back is the social worker. And the social worker, again, is shown on two lines, 8 and 20. On line 8, you see the salary cost of the social worker. And on line 20, you see the benefits cost of the social worker. This was a cut that we took in one of our most dismal budget years, and we put it back this year using carryover money. We need this third social worker. We need that person to assist in some of our highest poverty schools where we have attendance problems, where we have dropout problems, among other things, where we have families who may not know how to uh, work through the system to get the resources that they need for their children. And we need this person. And it doesn't need to go away. It needs to be there in the operating budget. 
college application week, line 50, it's a $50,000 expense, and this is the first year that we did it at all of our schools. I, along with several members of the school board, had the opportunity to see the power of helping students actually get ready and apply for post-secondary opportunities. College Application Week removed many of the barriers that are faced by first-generation students, students living in poverty, students from families that don't have the expertise to help their children through the process. It is so connected to our motto of engage, encourage, and empower that I really believe it belongs in our operating budget and needs to be consistently funded by this board. The Governor's Summer School on line seven, another move it to operating recommendation, line 47, it's a total cost of $7,343. A small number of students, a small cost in the big picture, but a huge return on investment, not only to the individual, but to our community. We have bounced this program off the list, on the list, and out to carry over several times. It keeps coming back because it's an important opportunity that needs to be funded in the operating budget. The next category are salaries and benefits enhancements. And they're actually four things that I'm going to talk about just a minute in this category. The first one being the two-step enhancement, and it's found on line 6 and 15. The salary cost is on line 6. The associated benefits cost to a salary enhancement is found on line 15. Continuing our dedication to improve employee salaries is imperative. You saw earlier the slide with the comparative salary data. Specifically, recouping the years of frozen steps and implementing the Evergreen study that we did last year is mission critical to Montgomery County Public Schools. This program started last year with the development of one makeup step and one new step. I want to see the program continue this upcoming year by again adding one makeup step and one new step. We are four years away from completing this program and bringing our salary steps where they need to be. The cost related to this change is $2,131,593. This number does not add money for employees who have topped out of the salary schedule. I have some other ideas about how we could possibly address these very valuable and experienced employees without further eroding the actual salary schedule. And I'll talk with you a little bit more about those when I come back and do the detail, but I think there may be some opportunities to deal with it in a different way with bonuses, uh, because every time you do an increase at the top, you end up creating, creating more little steps that are outside the salary schedule. So you're investing $2 million in trying to fix the salary schedule and you are further eroding the salary schedule by putting all these little pieces of, uh, you know, kind of like sub-steps outside it. So I'd like for us to consider some other ways of looking at that, and I'm, I'm prepared to talk about that some. Health insurance rate increase. Yes, we switched to self-insurance, but we took the actual savings last year because we saved the administrative costs last year, and so it helped us not have to increase what we had to kick in so much. But this year, we've already taken that savings, and although we will not hear from Anthem until the end of January about what they think the rate increase will be, the average that's being used throughout this area for the increase is about 10%. So for us, that's on line 18 and it's $826,151 additional in premium cost for the board to pay if you continue the position of paying for the employee only. The next one the, under salaries and benefits that's very complex from my perspective is the Affordable Care Act implementation. It's online 16 and 17. 
It's one of our non-negotiable budget increases because the feds say we have to do it unless they change the rules and they're not going to change them in time for us not to have to budget for it. Specifically, we are required to provide health insurance to part-time employees who work 30 to 39.99 hours per week. The plan must be identical to the plan offered to all of our full-time employees and it is now on the federal calendar for implementation October 2015. Based on the recommendation that I'm making, the cost to the division is $914,763. I'm going to come back to this item with an additional explanation at the end of the category overviews. The amount is offset by the fact that you've been budgeting a little over $200,000 a year just in case we had to do something quickly about the Affordable Care Act. So we can use that $200,000 to reduce this $900,000 to really $600 and some thousand dollars in new money. And you'll see it on the lines when we do the detail look. Another very complex one. And finally, the lapse in turnover, which is on lines 3 and line 11. So it also shows in, three, in two places because line 3 is the labor cost savings and line 11 is the benefits cost savings that's associated with this. The last time Montgomery County Public Schools did a lapse in turnover adjustment was 2010-2011. No one other than perhaps Ms. Franklin, Ms. Bond, and Mr. Ivers have seen this before. In essence, this item returns $1.4 million from personnel and benefits back to the operating budget for other needs of the school division. It largely occurs due to the replacement of more experienced employees with early career employees and through the natural process of time between resignations and actual employment of new personnel in a position. This is another item that I'll come back and do additional explanation about because I'm sure you wonder why haven't we seen this in the last three years. Well, it's because your salaries were stagnant, people were hanging on to their jobs, there were less people retiring or they were staying in positions longer. And so it had a huge impact on your labor budget and this summer we saw a pretty significant shift in that and it's going to result in this $1.4 million. The next category. Some additional things that we need. We need to focus on increased bandwidth and this is line 30 and it's a cost of $121,500. Over the last three years we've been using savings from a competitive federal grant to increase bandwidth each year without having to come to the board for more money. The savings from the grant have now all been used and we need to continue that bandwidth expansion so that we can support some of the instructional programs that I mentioned earlier such as Read and Math 180, iStation, Interactive Achievement, Google Classroom. There have also been huge changes in how content is delivered in classrooms over the internet. And you see now a lot of streaming, audio and video, voice communication and high definition video that are embedded in the instructional materials that are being used in our classrooms. And finally, we have the ever increasing number of devices in the district. We have not only bring your own device and we have e-backpack, but we have 21st century. And so we have become a district that has uh, a big investment in technology. And as you increase the availability of technology, you have to have the pipeline to provide the access that it needs to function as it should. Next, the e-backpack program year two, and it's found on line 7, 19, 59, and 50, because there are lots of little things in this program, including a personnel piece with a technician, including actual technology uh, devices, um, including um, some state grant money that goes with it. The benefit of putting technology into each student's hand, I think, is immeasurable. 
I recommend that once again we take advantage of the state grant that helps us offset some of the cost of the tablet initiative for all ninth graders. Our teachers have received the training over the past few months and are ready for the deployment of the iPads to students any day now. Last year's pilot program tells us that students in a school benefit from additional electronic devices in the classroom. Next year, I hope that we will continue this program providing every ninth grader a tablet. The cost of this program to Montgomery County Public Schools above the state grant is $358,636. And you find it, as I said, on the four lines, 7, 19, 59, and 60. <coughs> In your budget, there's a revenue line of $213,000, and if you, if you choose not to fund the e-backpack program, then the $213,000 goes away, and the bottom line revenue in the budget is reduced by that amount as well. So I tried to be specific about exactly what it is in additional cost to the board. The next additional need is improved CTE program options, and you find the cost for that on lines 5, 14, and 36. It actually is a grand total cost of 33480 Interesting, Ms. Franklin and I happened to be in the same place and listening to a group of Christiansburg High School students, and this particular recommendation arose out of that conversation that took place that day with those students. Uh, one of the recommendations is to expand the CTE program offerings by changing how we transport students from our smaller schools, AHS and EMHS, to take advantage of these programs. Previously, students from AHS and EMHS were transported only to CHS, thus limiting the offerings for students to take and limiting the number of CHS students who could take advantage of the programs that were offered on their own school. Now that we have Blacksburg High School back in its own campus and it has career and technical labs, it appears appropriate that we would open both of those schools to accommodate the needs of AHS and EMHS. And so instead of CHS having to set aside 10 slots, five for AHS and five for EMHS, we're hoping that that could be reduced to five at CHS and five at BHS, thus increasing opportunity for the kids in their home school, and at the same time not taking away from the opportunities of the students at AHS and EMHS. And the total cost of that is largely transportation. It's $33,480, and it, it is a, a thing that I consider increasing ex access and increasing equity of opportunity. Slide 27, the capital expenditures, and this is one that we've been round and round and round with, but these are essentially the same ones that we've had on here every year. I've increased them a little bit. Uh, you're used to seeing them, but you're also used to seeing them as a special request to the supervisors because they have graciously funded it in some years from their carryover or from their 13th month tax when they uh, in enhance the tax rolls. That did not happen last year. We paid for it from our carryover money. I think it's critical that these items remain in our budget. They are part of our need as it is continuous revenue is needed to provide them every year. The items total to $775,000 and they are as follows. Technology, line 65, $250,000 essentially uh, improves our resources and specifically maintains and enhances the 21st century classroom environment concept. Line 67, buses. I increased that line this year to 350. We've been adding just two over the last few years, but this time I have increased that line. Hopefully that we would be able to add four buses from uh, the operating fund. There, there are always two that are budgeted every year in, this, in the budget. But this would add four more and help us maybe begin to address a little bit the need that we have to actually be replacing nine a year or adding nine a year. Building repair and roof maintenance. The last thing you can afford to lose is your roof. $250,000, it's in line 69. We have a roofing plan and we have been diligently pursuing it over the last five years 
and it, it saves our facilities. <coughs> if you have water intrusion, you have lost your building, you have set a stage for mold and mildew and not environment, environmentally healthy uh, situations for students or adults. Safety enhancements is on line 70 and it's $25,000. This represents the match for a state grant of $100,000. We intend to apply again this year. We have more needs. Following the drill that we had in November, our schools compiled a list of additional safety enhancements and some of those we would be able to address through the grant and the match funds shown on line 70. And the final category of adjustments <coughs> were the accounting adjustments. And there are just two items here, and I'll speak to them very briefly. There are many acceptable accounting methods for, for doing certain operations. Montgomery County Public Schools has historically added special income using a system of supplemental revenue. They bring it to the board. They say, approve the supplemental revenue, and then we spend it. But there's another way to do that. And another way to do that is when you know you're going to have this revenue and you've built a track record of knowing you have this revenue, you can go ahead and put it in your budget. And I'm recommending that we do that for these two things. The first one is before and after childcare. And it, it is only related to those schools that we have that operate their own childcare program. What they do, they hire people to run their child care, but they don't have a payroll system. So we run their payroll through Montgomery County Public Schools. Then the school writes us a check for the um, payroll that we ran, and then come, we come back at some later point in the year and show it to you as uh, supplemental income, and then we put it back in the budget. So we know we get it. We know it's $300,000. And so I'm recommending that we go ahead and just put it on the budget line so that we don't have to come back uh, to you with that. There's, there's no need to. The second one that is the same kind of thing is E-rate reimbursement. And I put it here for two reasons. Number one, we have a track record. We know for many years that we're going to get approximately $263,000 in E-rate reimbursements. So why not just go ahead and budget it instead of having Harvey spend his regular budget and then later come to you with a supplementary budget that goes into his budget to replace what he already spent. When we can just budget it and when it comes in, it gets spent just like it always has been spent. It's just a different way of doing the same accounting function. Accomplishes exactly the same thing, but it's simpler. It's a little bit more transparent because the money's right there and everybody sees it in your budget from the beginning. And then to come back to the three areas that are a little more um, detailed and these are some of the ones that I have spent a lot of time thinking about and not sleeping about and trying to figure out what the best thing to do is with these. The first one is the salary enhancement. And I showed you across here what it cost if you did one step, and I showed you two steps. And when the Evergreen study was presented to you all last year, you know, we really hoped that we would be able to close this gap on five barren years in terms of compensation and move our employees along. And so I weighed in on the side of $2.1 million to do one step and a makeup step for all of our employees. My idea for how to handle the folks who are at the top of the scale is to look at bonuses from the carryover money. And you're going to have carryover money. And you can establish the amount. It would not be recurring. But many of the people who are at the very top of our salary schedule are also the employees who are retirement age, or who may be considering retirement at, an, at another time in the near future. You have a salary scale issue also. And you heard the folks talking about it tonight. You heard the AAs talk about having been promised something. And you heard the folks from technology 
saying that they were promised something. There was a market analysis done back in maybe 2007, and there were some specific targeted areas for enhancement or changes in the salary uh, schedule. My, my thought would be at this point that you would be better off to deal with the top of the scale with bonuses for one year only, take perhaps some of your carryover money, and let's do a 2015 market study. Because what was said in 2007 probably does not carry a great deal of validity anymore. And if we're going to try to start working on this, the plan itself, we ought to have good data. So I would, rather than erode the salary schedule that we have, I'd like to see us hire some professionals to do a market analysis and look at where we are. I mean, I can tell you recently that I've lost two good people from uh, human resources, payroll, and accounting to Montgomery County, not to Montgomery County Public Schools, but to Montgomery County with significant changes in compensation. And they work right across the hall. So it's time, I think, that we try to invest in our salary schedule. Let's look at it and see what's wrong with it and what's right with it and what should we be doing and what would it cost to start addressing it instead of uh, putting as many Band-Aids on it, perhaps, as, as we have been doing. So that's why I recommended the two steps and deal with the uh, folks who are off the salary schedule using some carryover money and look at it in a different way and consider also a market analysis study. The next one was the 30 hours part-time employees. And you can just read across the line and that's what I'm going to do because I think that's the way to tell it the best. Montgomery County Public Schools has 229 employees who work 30 to 39.99 hours for us. For us to provide them 10 months of health insurance, just like we provide for our full-time employees, would cost us, column two, $148,000 a month, or $1.488 million for 10 months. These people, the 229 employees, also earn a part-time incentive. And as was mentioned when we talked, when the employee groups were talking, part-time incentives started as an opportunity for part-time employees to go out and purchase IRA, some kind of retirement plan, or health insurance on their own. So now the federal government is going to mandate that we provide a $7,000 a year health plan for each of these employees in this category. So I recommend that those employees who are going to become fully insured by Montgomery County Public Schools no longer earn the part-time incentive. This does not touch the part-time incentive that's paid to any other employee. It only touches the part-time incentive that's paid to the group of employees who are now eligible for our full-time health plan. The cost to do it the way I've recommended is $914,763 minus the $200,000 that you've been budgeting for uh, emergency purposes. So it's like, you know, little, almost $700,000 in new money. I looked at it every way I could look at it, but I couldn't justify the part-time incentive and a full-fledged health insurance plan which is another reason that I think this market analysis might be important. Because if we're underpaying people in that job category, perhaps it would emerge in a market analysis and we might have a way to adjust the salary schedule as opposed to putting a Band-Aid on it, which is the part-time part incentive money. If you wanted to for this group of employees to have the part-time incentive and the full health insurance plan, your cost would rise to 900 plus five, uh, plus another, it would be the $1.4 million uh, dollars that you see in column three, minus the $200,000 that we've been putting in that little emergency fund. So it's a big, ticket item and it's a very tough uh, decision to make and 
you don't have the data really to make the decision yet because the decision is going to be made at the federal level. Will they implement? Maybe, maybe not. Will they shift the number of hours to 35 or 40? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. The final one that I wanted to talk about a little bit was the lapse in turnover. And over the last several years, our turnover has been very low. Our compensation increases have been small or non-existent. Our number of retirements has been relatively low, and our carryover has been low, less than 1% in 2011, 12, and 2012, 13. And 1% is a very low fund ending balance or carryover for an organization of this size. So thus, you have not seen lapse in turnover adjustments to the budget since 2010-11. This year, several things have occurred that led me to recommend this adjustment. Turnover increased by about 30 percent and significant savings occurred. Of 84 new hires this summer, 60 of those employees, just 60 of them, had an average savings of $13,650 each for a total of almost $820,000 in savings on those 60 employees who were hired in zero to five and largely repay, replace people who were at the upper limits of our salary schedule. These labor cost savings plus the usual lapse of time between a vacancy occurring and the actual filling of the vacancy produce a substantial savings that we can capture at this time. Finance and HR have looked very closely at this. They've looked at individual earnings and projected how much more we have to pay out for every single employee in the division and what's going to be left in the labor budget at the end of the line. Therefore, I feel comfortable recommending that we restore $1.4 million as a safe amount to reallocate in the budget. This is a common business practice that you have not seen in a while because of the economic conditions that we've been experiencing. So, the grand total addition to the budget above the current known state funds an assumption of level funding from the other sources. And remember, we are assuming that the county will give us the same amount of money, that the feds will give us the same amount of money, because we don't know yet. But the grand total increase is found on line 74, far right-hand column, bottom row, $3,400,512. Your Known revenue or expected revenue is $97,929,000 59, $929, and it's found on line 73, far right-hand column. And the total budget proposed to you this evening, incorporating the enhancements that I've reviewed with you, is $101,329,563. Now, back to what is before us. I have presented you with recommendations for a needs-based budget this evening. I'm prepared to answer questions. However, you've just received it, and it is a lot to digest. Between now and January 20th meeting, I may make some changes, but I will bring it back to you on January 20th, requesting that you adopt it for a public hearing. You have opportunity to make changes. Those opportunities occur on January the 20th. They occur following the public hearing on January 27th. And they occur on February 3rd when you are asked to approve a budget to send to the Board of Supervisors. I will take the budget that you approve on February 3rd and turn it over to the county manager no later than February the 6th. So what does a needs-based budget look like? It's the budget that allows you to engage and encourage and empower the students, the staff, the employees that we have from Montgomery County Public Schools. And it's the one that lets you actually accomplish your mission, your vision, and your core values. And that is the needs-based budget presentation for this evening.
board members, any questions? Uh, just one that I just jotted down just quickly. Uh, you stated something about the market analysis costs, mm -hmm. um, or, or what, uh, doing a market analysis. What would the cost of that be? Is that in-house? No, we would bid it out. I can't tell you. Uh, Joe can tell you what we paid for the salary study when we had Evergreen do that, and uh, we would we would bid a market analysis and job category study out. Depending on the scope of the of the project, you're probably looking at somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand okay. dollars to do a comprehensive market analysis. Okay. I think it's important that uh, the audience understands that we listen to them, and I think it's reflected in your budget that we did listen to them, and. Um, there's still a difference of three million four hundred thousand dollars. The the cuts are going to be very very difficult if there's any cuts at all. And I'm looking at this thing. I'm thinking, wow. The point is, we need more funding, and the only way we get more funding is to work through the supervisors. And I think it would behoove those presenters this evening to tailor their speeches to meet, um, tailored to give to the supervisors so that they can hear exactly what you have to say. Um, I know that we'll be attending some of the supervisors' meetings and speaking to them, but it's always, it's always good to have um, allies behind you. This is, a, this is, to me, it's a very, very lot to um, comprehend, and I need time. I understand. Any other comments, board members? Well, it was a great presentation and easy to follow, so I appreciate the detailed aspects of it and a lot to digest, that's for sure. So that's why we have time. <laughs> I agree. I, I appreciate the breakdown. But will we get something that will pull that back together so we can, you yeah. know, just see exactly what that total dollar will be in those categories. For each of the recommendations, I'd be happy to do that, yes. You have a hard copy. Are there more hard copies available? Of the budget, Katie? I work very, very well with hard copies. <laughs> no, no, no. no. That's what I would have. I was talking about this presentation. Yeah, oh. That. oh. You have a hard copy of that? Not with us, but we can get you. Can you got one? Okay. And anybody else who needs one, if you let us know, we're happy to get you one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blackburn. You're welcome. And I really do appreciate the attention to detail and what you presented tonight. It's definitely what we've been looking for. All right, board members. Our next item is for us as a board to discuss some of the, uh, the District E interview procedures. Um, we've been speaking via email over the past couple of days. We've been advised on a couple of different things uh, concerning how we need to handle that. Um, I, I want to open it up for discussion right now for anyone who may have any concerns about what's being uh, presented over the past couple of days and, and at last week's meeting. One uh, just word of caution, just to, to remind you, um, our attorney has suggested that we not specifically address or talk about any questions that we have uh, come up with at this point as so to not give any potential candidate uh, a heads up on what we may or may not ask them. So with that said, um, I want to open it up for discussion and then let you guys speak into it. There are a couple of things I want to address, but I'll let you guys speak first. I think just I'm the curious about the procedure since I haven't been in one. You know, are we going to be assigned to a question and then take turns to ask that question? 
you know, from the list that is provided, I mean, we each provided two questions that will make 12. Are we going to ask them all? Are we going to select few to ask? I mean, how that's going to work out? That's my question. How has that been handled in the past? Been done in the past. Uh, I believe in the past, each board member asked one question. Okay. So you get to pick which <coughs> question if you submitted. Okay. Yeah. More than one. That's, yeah. yeah, that was well, right. Plus, the same question is asked of each candidate. Yeah. Okay. You don't change questions. You don't change yeah. questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at this point. I, I like, I think that's exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. That way we have instead of 12 questions, we narrow it down to seven. Right. And that's a reasonable number. 12 gets cumbersome. Okay. So basically each, uh, each of us will ask one question and however many candidates will ask the same one question. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we can That's what I mean, I thought. And I believe we can probably communicate that either at the next meeting or through email. Which, well, which question each one of us wants to ask. Am I correct? Can we do that through email? I, I don't, yeah, I think I, was, I don't know that I'm going to know the answer to that question until that night. Well, <laughs> all questions were sent to us by email. Yeah. So I'm thinking we're on safe ground yeah. if we make a decision as to which ones we want to ask. Yeah. What I'm saying is what question I'm going to find that I need to ask that night out of the two that I submitted. I don't know if I'll know that, if I know the answer to that even right now, or I don't even know if I'll know it before the words come out of my mouth when I ask the question. Well, it, yeah, because if someone else chooses one that is very similar to your topic, you don't want to choose right. that. Right, and exactly. Right. But, right. So, that's what I'm saying. Well, but that's why it needs to be communicated, so yeah. that way. If we do it through email, we'll that, know that yeah. we're not doing the same thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. we won't ask If we go in, or I don't know what kind of order we're going to go in, but if I see like that Penny ask about something that is very similar to one of the questions I pick, I'll just choose the other one. Yeah, but I only picked one. I felt so because knowing that we only done one before, that's why I oh, okay. stuck with one. Okay. So I think that's what we need to do is you need to pick one of the two that you s and say, okay, this is what I'm going with, and then we can go through it. And if you know, yeah, because we, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Because so if somebody because I believe question. before we actually were given a mm -hmm. copy of the questions we were going to ask, mm -hmm. so that one through seven, everybody solved. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the question you're going to okay. ask. Yeah. All right. And we just did it so order. I, I can I, mean, I can adjust make that adjustment. If that's is that what we want to do? Just have one of those questions of the ones that we submitted. <laughs> is everyone in agreement to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's what I need for everyone to do is to email me your final question uh, within the next. Let's try to do it by next Tuesday. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. so we have it. So it's all together. So we have it together. Um, and then if that list comes about and it looks like. A couple are kind of repetitive mm -hmm. right can we adjust yeah yeah we can we can make the make some adjustments well, well let me ask you this um, would it be safer and and more ex and expedited quick uh, more quick let's redundant if we copied each other as to which question we want to and that way I'll know what Miss Franklin's doing and I'll know what Miss Woolsey's doing would that be appropriate if nobody changes their mind, yeah. the list that we had already, none of them were repetitive. I didn't think so, so either. Yeah, I didn't I think so. They were a, little, a couple of them, but mm -hmm. you know. oh, I, I thought they were all really different myself. Yeah. But you know, I thought they were pretty well representative. I, I thought they too. were pretty well rounded questions. I'm going to send you my question that I'm going to ask, and okay. I'm going to copy everybody. Okay, that's fine. That's what I yeah, yeah, yeah. do that, please. And yeah. then as I compile the six questions that we're going to answer, I will re-email those questions out so everyone has a copy. Okay. Um, so, I would like to have a printed copy in front of me when we do that, just so okay. I can yeah. just keep track of something. Yeah, I will email, every, but yeah, by Tuesday, that's why I'm asking everyone to submit their questions by Tuesday, we'll, we'll have a printed copy and give that out on Tuesday evening. If you get it to Ms. Drake, she's happy to do right. okay. the final copy. Very good. Everyone. We'll do that. Six questions to Brenda. Well, really, it's six. I guess it's six. Yeah, six questions. Yeah. You'll have a final copy. I, I do have one question about this, and maybe, maybe it was addressed, and I just skipped it. Um, as far as 
if we do have multiple candidates in the room, do we ask the the candidate who is not asking or not being asked or who is being interviewed, those that are not being interviewed, let me say this again, to leave the room while we're interviewing or are they allowed to stay in here? They, they, all like stay. Yeah. The they all stayed before. Uh -oh. Okay. Yeah. They were in the back we, we brought them in one at a time. Oh, yeah. Did we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. one well, other vice table here. Well, it wasn't here. Arnold's it was over. I remember Karen saying sitting in the back and right. listening to everybody was really kind of just. So the two candidates, I know one time or three candidates. Look meeting right. If there's two, one's here, the other one's in the conference room. Right. If yeah. there's three, same thing. Right. Okay. I guess my, my, my question in asking that, and the reason I ask that is, I mean, if they hear the question yeah. ahead of time, yeah. obviously the they're going to, I can formulate answer. my answer a lot quicker when yeah. I have time to think about it. Exactly. So, uh, so I guess that's the procedure that we will follow on that. Okay. And then we allow them time to make a statement. As yes. To, you know, at the end. Why? At the beginning or at the end? I believe it was at the end after yeah, we okay. asked after we've asked yeah, questions. Was, right. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, time limit as to their uh, giving their statements. I heard in the past that it's five minutes. Is that correct? That's about okay, right. so let's do five minutes. Anyone objecting to that? Okay. Uh, what about if there are follow-up questions to answers or anything like that? How are we going to handle that? I don't. <laughs> we didn't do that last time, though. I don't think there were any follow-up questions with it. So do we remember all that? Yeah. I think we just asked the question and. Do we have a time limit on the answer to the question? I mean, I don't want to. Well, because some people can. can I mean, some, yeah. Want to give more mm. information and. I don't know that we need to have a time limit, okay. but. Well, wait. A okay. Everyone was here, but but um, we had one candidate who really could go on a bit, and uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe. Although. Probably we can say thank you. That's enough, and yeah. whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but we I don't mind have, taking we, the lead on yeah, that. <laughs> we we did have one that went on a little bit, but we'll work okay. Out. All right. Yeah, I think we'll be pretty judged. I'll, maybe I'll keep a little my personal timer going on over here, and if it starts to go a little long, yeah. then um, wind up. Yeah, yeah. I'll either, I'll throw the gavel at him. <laughs> Okay. Um, follow up questions. Follow up questions. If someone you ask the questions, you know, and you're not clear mm -hmm. as to what they actually meant or something, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to ask for clarification on a mm -hmm. statement, uh -huh. not go only one time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm okay yeah. with clarification, especially. I mean, if we're if they answer something and it's kind of muddled and we feel like we need to a, a little bit more clarification or that whoever a particular board member is let's limit it to whoever asked the question so if you ask the question and you need clarification or feel like you need clarification then you ask for it but if i don't get what they're saying i don't know that i need to have them clarify your question does that make sense well the questions that everyone is answer asking mm -hmm they're going to influence how I make my decision. Mm -hmm. So if I need clarification on okay. someone's question, I might. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But you're saying that would be one follow-up question. Is that what you would say? Or? I'm sorry. <laughs> now I can see you. <laughs> I can hear you better when I see you. <laughs> you would have one follow-up question. Is that what you were saying? Well, I think a question of clarification. Yeah. Okay. Question of yeah. clarification. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we. I don't think we'd want to, unless somebody just really was kind of different, that we'd all have to keep asking yeah. for something. Yeah, yeah. At this point, Mrs. Blackburn, we're still only at one candidate, correct? That is correct. Okay. Mm. So this one might be. Letter has been received. This could, and it's the cutoffs Wednesday. Is that right? The twenty-first. Okay. Well, that would be easy. 
Yeah, that would make it very easy. Yeah, we wouldn't have to ask a question at all. Would we? <laughs> okay. Any further discussion on this? I, I just, I, the one last thing that I want to say, just remember, you know, as we're doing this, this is an interview. And it's okay for us to ask tough questions. Um, you know, we're really, we're taking the place of an electorate here. Mm -hmm. The six of us are taking place of their district voting them in. And I know even, it's, even though it's for a short time, so I think it's okay for us to ask tough questions, ask for cl clarification, scrutinize if we need to because we are making an important decision because they potentially are going to be the tie-breaking vote in a lot of different areas for us and they are going to come into I mean as soon as they get sworn in they're gonna be talking about budget they're gonna be talking about school start times so it's okay for us to be just like a regular job interview tough and ask those questions and be okay with it all right you act like that's something different <laughs> huh you act like that's something that happens differently <laughs> well i mean well i'll, I'll, leave, it I'll leave it all right nothing else we'll move on to agenda prep and you see there on your ipads our upcoming meetings Anybody have anything to add or any questions? Uh, one thing that was added, and I know that we're all aware of, is the dedication for AMS um, a week from Sunday. Hopefully, most of us, if not all of us, can be there. Um, Brenda Drake will contact you to make sure who's okay. going to be there and who's not, or ask you to please let us know. So, any other questions? Looks like the schedule's been redone as we needed. All of our public hearings are scheduled. Safe. I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Um, the February 3rd meeting, I've got to be in Northern Virginia early in the morning of the 4th. And what I, what I would request, I don't know if we can do it or not, but I would request that um, the budget approval be put first on the agenda just as soon as possible and any other items that need to be voted on so so I could possibly get on the road as soon as possible otherwise I got to get up at like four in the morning which I'd rather not do I don't know if this is if I'm asking something is out of line or if it can be done or um, that's just a regular meeting we don't have any awards or anything right. that night correct right. The, the only thing I think we probably do have is um, public address. Mm -hmm. And if it's possible, I, I, would I would ask that we could do a couple of items that need to be voted on even before that. But again. I, don't, I, just, I, I don't know if I'd want to do that because there may be items that are on the agenda that people want to speak into before we actually vote on them. I definitely think that we should keep public address before we do anything that we vote on. Um, hmm. So we'll take a note of that. I mean, I we'll see how it, the, the agenda is going to be prepared. We're, we're, we'll be working on that one next week. No, it's two weeks or, yeah, or two in two we weeks. Got of time. I'm sorry. I just want to bring it to your attention okay. because. Um, if, if there's anything we can do to get me out of here okay. as soon as possible, I'd appreciate it. But okay. If we can't do it, we can't do it. Okay. We'll work on it. We'll see what we can do. Anything else? I was just going to ask you, you said 630 for next Tuesday. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. 20th? Yes. We will have closed, se closed session next Tuesday. And that's 630. 630. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, if, ever, if all the board members will read through the document that I sent to you so that we can come prepared uh, to just move through that pretty quickly. I think the bulk of the work has been done, Let's uh, and we'll try to move through that pretty quickly. And I have asked, I, I think I stated in the email, I have asked for 
our attorney to be present to be available if we need to ask anything or do anything with that he'll be here okay he will mr king will be here okay great mr king will be here very good did you want to clarify everybody's email address that are yeah working? I, we Guna and I met earlier today and one of the things that I think we had meant to mention it uh, uh, several weeks ago that never got we never got around to was uh, our email situation sometimes uh, Mr. Ivers apparently I have the wrong email address for you um, is it possible for us to get two things uh, make sure that we have every the the board members group that we have that I think it also goes to um, Ms. Drake and, and Mrs. Blackburn. Um, just make sure that we have everyone's correct address on that one so that it, when we hit that, it gets sent and we know that people are getting that. So um, if, there, if you do have a preferred email address, make sure that Ms. Drake has that so that we, we can make sure that that list is correct. I thought um, after a couple of issues that happened, it was requested to change board members to just be board members. And that was the second part of my question. It was the second thing we wanted to do. We want to have a list that is just board members that does not include um, Ms. Drake, Ms. Blackburn. So when we do things like the superintendent's evaluation, it's just quick. We can do it, and we know that it's not being sent to the wrong place. So that isn't true currently. If you type in board members, if you type in board members right now, it goes to you, correct? Board members at MCPS. Dot org goes to me and goes to Brenda Drake. Okay. And Celeste, goes, does it go to you too? Yes, ma'am. I thought so. Okay. So can we make an adjustment on that and get two different groups and it just be clearly defined which group is which? Okay. Anything else? May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned.